So have you ever heard something or saw something or experienced something and thought, where did that come from? You wonder, what's the origin? How does that even exist? Take bubble wrap, for example. So bubble wrap is a $4 billion industry. There's a bubble wrap appreciation day, which is the last Monday in January. And the best thing about bubble wrap is popping bubbles, right? <laughs> in fact, there are actually therapists who are starting to use that as a form of therapy, as a sensory. Uh, the second best use for bubble wrap is keeping things safe in the mail. It's Amazon. But that wasn't the intention for bubble wrap. In fact, bubble wrap was a mistake. In 1957, Alfred Fielding and Marcus Chavanez found a way to seal pockets of air in between two plastic shower curtains. Their goal was to create a three-dimensional pattern of tiny bubbles that could be used as wallpaper. Yes, wallpaper. Bubble wrap was originally intended to be wallpaper for your house, but shockingly, people didn't want that. And so they began to try and market bubble wrap in other ways. One way was insulation for greenhouses, which also failed. It wasn't until 1961 that the protective usage was discovered, striking a deal with the computer company IBM. Their product was purchased to wrap up the IBM 1401 computer. And the rest is history. Their failed attempt to create the newest trend in wallpaper became the world's first engineered protective packaging material. Wheaties originally started as gruel, but when the inventor accidentally dropped the mushy breakfast mix on a stove, it baked into flakes, and he changed his plan. Penicillin came from Alexander Fleming. He left out a petri dish, and it grew mold. Seeing the mold stop the bacteria from growing, he realized that this mold could be used for a wide array of uses, including medicine. Slinkies were originally invented to keep fragile instruments safe on naval ships. But one day, Richard James accidentally knocked one off the shelf and saw it slink to the ground, and he immediately knew that this would keep kids entertained for hours. There's something about learning the origin and backstory that makes the things that we experience on a daily basis more exciting and more interesting. And so have you ever thought that way when it came to the church? Have you ever wondered how the church started? Where did the church come from? What is the origin? Why do we do what we do in church? Did Jesus do those things? Did someone else just make them up? And so over the next five weeks, we're going to be in a series called Roots, where we're going to explore just that. We're going to learn about how the church started and what the first church looked like. And we're also going to talk about some of the things that we do at Collective and care about at Collective and how that influence came from the early church. And so a lot of times people ask where Collective comes from. They'll say, where did this church come from? And they aren't necessarily asking where I came from or even why we started a church. They're trying to figure out what type of church we are. Some of you have asked the same question or thought the same thing. You've wondered, where are the roots of this church? And that makes sense because church planning is kind of a weird concept. A year ago, there wasn't a church here, and now there is. And so people wonder, where did this church come from? What are the roots? And so Collective launched last fall on September 17th. And so we'll actually be celebrating our first birthday on September 16th, which is a Sunday. So mark your calendars because it's going to be awesome. Uh, we made it a whole year. <laughs> well, I guess we're not there yet, so we'll see what happens. But Collective is a non-denominational church. And in the church world, denomination is another word for governance. You can kind of replace those words with each other. And so the main difference between denominational churches and non-denominational churches is how the bodies, the church bodies, are governed and run. In denominational churches, there are local, regional, and worldwide leaders who determine the direction of a church. These denominational leaders dictate doctrine and what those churches believe. These denominational leaders will dictate how money is spent. They often dictate who the preacher is, and when a preacher moves, they actually have to replace that person instead of the local church figuring that out. And so ultimately, denominations control the movement of the other churches inside that denomination. Non-denominational churches are governed locally, meaning for us, collective specifically, we have a leadership team that help us make decisions. Right now, that's what we call a management team, and that actually consists of five pastors from the D.C. area who I meet with once a month. They act as kind of our overseers and our elders right now. They help us set our budget. They help us hire staff. They hold me accountable. And eventually, at some point, as Collective grows and this body continues to get bigger, we'll actually develop local leaders from this church who will then oversee it. So being non-denominational means that we have more freedom to choose the direction and vision of the church. We don't have to go to people outside of our region or outside of our district to figure out what to do. And we do all that while still being held accountable by local leaders that are in this place. 
And so while we are a non-denominational church, our roots are in a movement of church planning that's called the Restoration Movement or Stone Campbell Movement. And so here's the history of that movement. And for me, I like love this stuff. I love history, like the origins of where things came from. I'm a nerd, I know. But if you're a history buff, you'll like this. If not, buckle up, we're going. (laughs) So around 1800, pastors in America became concerned about the spiritual state of the church as well as the division that was seen in the churches in the United States. Now during this time, the church was incredibly fractured and unhealthy, and because of that, the church as we know it was dying. And one of the people who became concerned was a man named Thomas Campbell. Thomas Campbell was originally born in Ireland. His father grew up Catholic, but eventually changed denominations and became an Episcopalian. Thomas Campbell, on the other hand, grew up Episcopalian and eventually changed denominations to become a preacher in the Presbyterian Church. But he wasn't just a preacher in the Presbyterian Church. He was a preacher in the Old Light, Antiburger, Seceder Presbyterian Church. So old light in this actually literally means a division in the church. It meant that his church was a part of a split. Old light were the people that stayed around. New light were the people that left to start the new church. Anti-Burger meant that his church was opposed to the Burgess Oath. Seceder actually signifies another split and meant that his church left the Church of Scotland at some point. And so he was a part of this church culture, and each one of these names represents a different division that was in the church. Like I said, it was incredibly unhealthy. And so when Thomas Campbell was an adult, he actually had some health issues, and his doctor recommended a sea voyage. Some of you are thinking right now, I need to find that doctor. Like, (laughs) I'm not feeling well. Go on a cruise. So he came alone to America. He actually left his family behind, but with the intent of bringing them over later. And while he was there, he began looking for opportunities to preach, but was only welcome in old light, anti-burger, seceder, Presbyterian churches. In fact, there's a legend that one afternoon while he was walking into town, he bumped into a man that was a preacher at a local Presbyterian church. And so Thomas Campbell told the man that he was looking for opportunities to preach, that he used to be a preacher over in Ireland, and now he's here. And when the pastor asked him what, part of, what church he was a part of, he said, I'm old light. And the guy said, oh, me too. He goes, well, I'm anti burger And he's like, oh, yeah, that's me as well. He goes, and I'm a seceder Presbyterian. Upon hearing this, the pastor said that he would never let a seceder preach from the pulpit of his church, and he walked away. And so through instances like this, Campbell began to reflect on how horrible it was for Christian people who have allegiance to Jesus as leader and believe the Bible as the word of God to be so divided from one another, especially considering the fact that Jesus prayed that all Christians would become one, and he constantly taught about unity. And so while in America, he got to thinking, wouldn't it be great if we could forget about the old light, anti-burger, seceder, Presbyterian church, and just go back to being the church? He said, let's do things the Bible's way and forget about these creeds and denominational divisions. Eventually, he withdrew from the old light, anti-burger, seceder, Presbyterian church, and he would say, I represent no denomination. He would say, I'm non-denominational. About a year later, his wife Jane and his son Alexander set sail for America, but as they were making their way across the Atlantic, they, they were actually shipwrecked. After seeing his life almost end, Alexander began to think seriously about his relationship with Jesus and his purpose in life. That tends to happen when your life flashes before your eyes, right? So it was another year before Thomas Campbell was united with his family, but upon greeting his son, they were both startled to find out that they had arrived at the same conclusion when it came to the church. It was time to quit being divided from Bible-believing Christians through denominationalism. It was time to simply try to restore the church to the New Testament Christianity as started in the book of Acts and seen in the following books of the Bible. At the same time, another similar movement sprung up in Kentucky. Barton W. Stone was another Presbyterian preacher down in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, and he began to be concerned about all of the division. And he said, why don't we just go back to the Bible and let's use that instead of creeds and denominational differences. Let's just call ourselves Christians, not anti-burger, old light, seceder, Christians. And so there was a great revival that took place in Cane Ridge, Kentucky in 1800, and it said that 25,000 people met in Cane Ridge that day, which was about one-eighth of the population of Kentucky at the time. One of the highlights of this revival was when a thousand Presbyterians, an indeterminate number of Methodists and Baptists, all had communion together on a Sunday morning, which would not have been allowed in any of their churches. As the revival ended, the mood was let's break away from denominations that divide us and unite on Jesus Christ. Instead of trying to reform the church, they said, let's go back to the original pattern. Let's go back to its roots. 
Paul Konkin, a historian from Vanderbilt, actually said the Cane Ridge Revival was arguably the most important religious gathering in all of American history because it brought unity to many churches in the United States. And if that didn't happen, the church wouldn't exist today in the U.S., And so the goals of this movement are to restore the church, the restoration movement, and the goals of it are to restore doctrinal purity by using the Bible only as a source of authority. One of their goals is to free the church of creeds, traditions, and denominational distinctions that divide other churches, and to unify all Christians for the purpose of winning the world, for the purpose of going out and seeking same lost people and sharing with people that God is for them. Another way to say this is that there's no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ, and creed is a statement of belief, and no name but the divine name. There's no name but Jesus. And coming out of the restoration movement, there are a few slogans to describe the goals and desires of the pastors who are a part of this, who we're uniting together. And two of those impact everything that we do at Collective. The first is in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things love. Essentials are the things that deal with the character of God or the person of God. Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was sinless. He died on the cross and was literally and physically raised from the dead. Essentials being things that dealing with salvation, that sin is real and creates a debt that we cannot pay. And the payment for that is Jesus. Non-essentials are topics that we don't have to agree on in order to be united inside this church body or with other churches. Non-essentials doesn't mean things aren't important. It's just saying that we can disagree with other people in other churches, and it's okay, because they're not essential. And in non-essential, there's liberty. One non-essential are the views of Jesus' second coming. Jesus says that he will come back. We agree on that. But some people believe in premillennial or postmillennial or amillennial or a bunch of other millennial views about Jesus will come. And the idea is it's okay. It's okay if there are other churches and other people who believe different things, because we all agree that Jesus will come back. Non-essentials include opinions about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We agree that they're real because the Bible says that they are, but how they are used and how they are manifested, the frequency and intensity of them is something that churches don't have to agree on in order to be united. And non-essential is people's interpretation of creation and Genesis. We're not going to argue about that stuff at Collective because people can have other opinions and it's okay. We won't argue with other people and we won't argue with other churches. For us personally, we'll teach what, the, what we feel the Bible teaches about them. But here's the point. If we disagree, we're not saying that you're not a Christian because of it. Because those things are not essential. One of the best ways I've heard this when it comes to churches is that churches are like flavors of ice cream. So my favorite flavor is mint chocolate chip. And so every ice cream shop in Frederick, I always get mint chocolate chip because I compare them to each other. But most of my friends don't like mint chocolate chip. They think it's gross, and that's okay. I don't harass them. I don't yell at them for making weird ice cream choices. I don't tell them that they're wrong. I enjoy my ice cream, and they enjoy theirs. And so the church is the same way. Collective is mint chocolate chip, and the church down the road might be cookie dough. And you might not like the flavor of cookie dough, but it's okay because ice cream is good. And I think we can all agree on that. And the last thing in that is that in all things love, this idea that there should be a general atmosphere of respect for each other, that no matter what the issue is, as churches and as Christians, we should be high on grace. Another phrase that impacts who we are as a church is where the Bible speaks, we speak, and where the Bible is silent, we are silent. And so there are certain things that Scripture says, this is what it is, and so we trust that, and we believe that New Testament teaches baptism by immersion as a believer, so that's what we teach. We're actually going to talk about that in a few more weeks because some of you might have heard a different thing or learned a different thing growing up depending on what church you were in. The Bible says that sin is real and that it separates people from God. So that's what we teach. We're not going to waver on those things. But if the Bible is silent, we are silent. The Bible doesn't say anything about style of worship that we're supposed to have. We know that we're told to worship, but stylistically the Bible is silent. So we do the style that makes the most sense for us in our context. The Bible doesn't say anything about what you should wear to church on Sunday, so we're silent about that. You wear what you want. You be you. Be comfortable. I wear t-shirts every single Sunday because I don't own any collared shirts. So that's the movement that our church plan actually has roots in. We don't do church exactly the way that every other restoration church does it, but that's the beauty of it. In essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things love. And so my desire is to lead the church based solely on what Scripture says. And because of that, one of the places that we look for wisdom and one of the places that we look for truth and one of the places that we look for guidance is the book of Acts. 
Now, I'm going to be really honest with you. Some of you are going to struggle in this series. And some of you are going to struggle over the next five weeks as we talk about some of these things. Because you're going to be thinking, and we're going to be talking, and we're going to be reading. You're going to think, that's not what my grandma taught me. You're going to be thinking, that's not what the church said that I grew up in. That's not how I was raised. And so here's the thing. The number one application for this series, the number one application for really any single Sunday, but specifically this series called Roots is this. Read your Bible. It really is that simple. Read your Bible. Crack it open, find something, read it. One of the best places to start is John. It's very easy to understand. But I would encourage you, read Acts. If you ever wonder why the church looks or what the church should look like, the book of Acts is all about that. And so read your Bible. Don't take my word for it. I appreciate that you trust me. Don't take my word for it. Don't take your grandma's word for it. Don't take your former priest or pastor's word for it. Read your Bible. When my family first started going to church, my dad was sharing with my uncle about the reasons why he liked the church that we were going to. And I remember my uncle saying that it's great that they play great music and that the sermons are engaging, but what do they believe? My dad responded by saying, I don't know, I just know that it's a good church. But my uncle persisted, what do they believe? My dad said, I I don't know. And finally, my uncle was like, Scott, what do they believe? To which my dad responded, I don't know, just read your Bible. Actually, my dad said, I don't know, just read your fill-in-the-blank Bible. The word was not holy. So while there'll be other applications to this series, that's the main one. Just read your fill-in-the-blank Bible. And specifically, I would encourage you to read the book of Acts. So the book of Acts is the fifth book of the New Testament. It's the first book that was written after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. People often call the book of Acts the Acts of the Apostles. The apostles are people that were sent by God. These were the people that started the church. Another way that people talk about is Acts of the Early Church. And the book of Acts is the chronicle of how the church started. Acts starts with Jesus spending time with his followers before ascending into heaven after his resurrection from the dead. In Acts 1-3, it says this, After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. And so Luke, who writes the book of Acts, explains that after Jesus was crucified— And after he was buried, he resurrected from the dead and actually presented himself to his followers. At the time, there were about a few hundred people, but he gave them proof. He taught them about the kingdom of God. He gave them instruction on how to live moving forward. And then he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid hid him from their sight. And so Jesus actually ascends into heaven with a promise that one day he would come back. About seven days after this happened, a crowd was gathered in Jerusalem. And so Peter, one of Jesus' followers, actually sees this large group of people, and he decides to preach the gospel. He decides to preach the good news that Jesus was born, lived a perfect life, died on a cross for our sins, and then resurrected from the dead. And this is what he shares to these people. And the cool thing about this moment is this is kind of like the first sermon outside of Jesus. But he speaks not in theory, but he speaks about what he saw. He saw Jesus prove that he was the son of God. He saw Jesus perform many miracles and signs. He saw Jesus die on a cross and get buried in a tomb. He saw Jesus rise from the grave. And so he says in Acts 2.32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. And Peter's saying, I saw this with my own eyes. Like this person that you weren't sure of, this person that you heard about, this person that you were trying to figure out, is he real? Is he the son of God? Is, Is he even just crazy? Who is he? And Peter says, I saw it happen. But the story continues, and Peter says, Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And this is the response to the gospel. This is the response to the good news that Jesus died for you, that he presented himself as a perfect and willing sacrifice to pay the debt that our sin creates with God. When you understand this, and when that sinks in, the response is, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So Peter says, repent, which means turns away. Turn away from your old life. He says, be baptized, which again, we're going to talk about in a few more weeks. And he's saying this, that this is not just for the people who followed him before he died and resurrected. This is for the people that are there in that moment. And there are people for now and forever. 
And Peter doesn't know this, like he's just casting vision for this, but ultimately Peter's saying, hey, this is for everyone. This is why we get to do what we do here at Collective. Because Peter's saying, at some point, maybe other people will hear it and they have the opportunity to accept this gift as well. And so those who, accepted, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. And so here's this moment where thousands of people hear that Jesus is for them and they respond by giving their life to him, by making him the leader and savior of his life. And the natural thought would be, what now? Like, what do we do? Like, we shared the gospel, now people want to follow him. Where is Jesus in here? Like, how do we move forward? What do we do? And this is the catalyst for the first church. Before, it was just a group of people following Jesus trying to figure out if he was a liar, a lunatic, or Lord. But now it was up to them. And we actually see in Acts 2 their response. This is how they respond to this mass of people deciding to follow Jesus. They start the church. This is what it says. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. And so this moment is the start of the church. This is where I begin. This is the origin. A group of people saw Jesus resurrect from the dead. They told other people about it. Those people believed and were baptized. And the church came out of that. That's where the manifestation of the church came. And so in Acts 2, 42 through 7, it shares the characteristics. It tells us what the first church looked like. It says the church was devoted to the teaching of the apostles. They had a strong sense of community. They took communion together. They ate meals together. They took care of the people who had needs. They were united. They prayed. They praised God. They invited other people to experience Jesus, people who believed, people who were skeptical, people who were doubtful, and people who flat out hated Jesus. They were all welcome. And through all of this, the church grew. People began to follow Jesus. People were baptized. And this is the origin of the church. This is how it all began. So when we went to Start Collective, we didn't turn to a church planting guidebook. We didn't look at mega churches to see what they were doing. We focused on Acts 2. Because if it worked 2,000 years ago and the church still exists today, then it makes sense that it would work in Frederick in 2018. And so the thing I want to focus on today, and we're going to focus on different aspects of this church over the next five weeks, but the thing I want to focus on and strive to do to the best of our ability today is focusing on serving the community. In Acts 2.45, we're going to read that again. It says this, they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so if you've ever wondered why we do everything we do to love our community, if you've ever wondered why we support local organizations when first-time guests fill out connection cards, why we are restocking the food pantry over the next two weeks, why we package 10,000 meals for food insecure students in Frederick County, this is why. This is why. It's not something that we just sat down and thought, we should do this. The Bible teaches us that this is what the first church did, and it still exists 2,000 years later because that's how they function, then we are going to do that. And as a church, we're not going to stop doing these things. They sold property and possessions to give to those who had need. They took care of each other. If someone was hungry, they offered them food. If someone was thirsty, they gave them something to drink. If someone was without clothes, they provided for them because that's what Jesus commanded his people to do, so they did it. A few years ago, a friend of mine who was a church planner felt the burden to feed food insecure kids in his community. His church plan had actually just finished packaging 40,000 meals that were being delivered to the Philippines when a friend asked him, what are we going to do about the 60,000 kids struggling with food insecurity within one hour of our church? He said, how do we feed them? For the next six months, Ron couldn't stop thinking about that number and couldn't stop feeling the burden to help the students in his own community. And so one morning, he actually stood in front of his church, which at the time, they were a few years old. They were about 125 people. And he presented them with this problem. He said, there are 13 million kids in America that are food insecure. What do we do? And the overwhelming response from his church was to do everything they could to feed these kids, including shutting down the church and using all of their resources to make an impact. And that's exactly what they did. They closed Restore Community Church and started an organization called Generosity Feeds. And since the inception, they have packaged and delivered approximately 2 million meals for students who are food insecure. And by the end of the year, they'll actually deliver their 3 millionth meal. 
And so we're going to do the same thing. We're going to close the doors. I'm just kidding. We're not doing that. Some of you are like, that's a good thing now. <laughs> no, the best part about what Ron and Restore, and Restore Community Church did is that when they closed their doors, they did it so other churches could make an impact on their community. So Generosity Feeds partners with churches and helps them package and deliver meals to kids who are food insecure in their local context. As a church, we actually hosted our first event last year before we ever started Collective, before we ever had Sunday mornings, before we ever were setting up and tearing down in this place because we wanted our city to know that we were here for them. So before that ever happened, we decided we're going to package 10,000 meals, we'll fundraise the money, and we want to love the students that are in our community. And this October, we're actually doing it again. We're currently in the process of reaching out to local businesses to fundraise $10,000 so that we can package 10,000 meals for students who are food insecure in our community. In fact, there are students who are food insecure in this school right here that don't get any other assistance, and we want to be a solution to that. And so we realize that it's only a small dent. It really is only 10,000 meals. This county needs way more than that. But for us, it's just the beginning. We want to be a church that serves the community. We want to be a church that's for Frederick. That's why 10% of every dollar that's given to Collective is sent right back into the community. As a church, we actually tithe and support other organizations. We support church planning efforts because we think that this area needs more good, healthy churches focusing on what the church should be doing in Acts. We support a Haitian church plant called Home. And we support multiple local organizations, including Frederick Rescue Mission, Blessings in a Backpack, Religious Coalition, and a bunch more. And so our goal as a church is never to start anything new. We will never start a food pantry. We will never start a nonprofit outside of this church. But we don't have to. Organizations in our community already exist to do that, and our goal is to help those organizations grow, to reach more people, to make bigger impacts, because the needs in this community are huge, and that's what the church is supposed to do. That's what the church is called to do. That's what the church is told to do. In our county alone, there are 11,000 kids that are food insecure. It means when they leave school at the end of the day, they don't know where their next meal is coming from. Of the 11,000 kids, half of them are ineligible for government assistance. That's why restocking the food pantries in Frederick matters, because that's how those kids, specifically in our city, eat. There are 1,000 homeless students in Frederick County. In 61 out of the 66 schools in FCPS, there are kids that are homeless. This is why we do our best to partner with West Frederick Middle School and the Religious Coalition and the Mental Health Association. Because here's the thing, there are needs in our city and in our county, and it's our job as a church to meet those needs. So Collective will continue to serve, we'll continue to invest in our community, and more specifically, we'll continue to support the organizations who do more than we can, because it's truly how we meet the needs beyond the ones that are immediately in front of us. And the coolest thing about that, going back to the beginning of the story, going back to this idea of unity, we are not the only church doing that, and that is a good thing. Our desire is never that Collective is the only church investing in these places. Our desire is that every church in this county, even though we don't agree on all things, that we all agree on the fact that kids need to be fed, children shouldn't be homeless, that there's a drug problem in our county and the county surrounding us, and the church's job is to do something about it. And the reason why we do that is because we're called to. Jesus says to love God and love your neighbors as yourself. Jesus says to take care of the least of these. And that's exactly what the first church did. They did it passionately, they did it aggressively, and they did it without ceasing. And so we're going to do the same thing. My hope and my prayer is that this group of people joins with us, that you help us be a church that's actually for the city, not just says that we are, not just puts up fancy pictures of our city and say that we love it, but people who actually love our city and invest in our city. I don't know. People ask me all the time, like, what's the long-term goal for Collective? And we have some, but... To be honest, I have no idea how long this church will be around. I hope it's a very long time. But here's one thing that I hope and and one thing that I pray for all the time, that if one day this church doesn't exist, that that if for some reason that we, this church just dies or we move or whatever it may be, my hope is that at some point, if this church ceases to exist, which again, I don't hope ever happens, but I hope if that does, I hope the city feels it. And I hope they feel it not because of anything that we do on Sunday morning, because of the way that this group of people loves our city and the way this group of people strives to meet the needs in our community. And I hope you guys are a part of that. Our county needs this desperately. There are people who don't know where the next meal is coming from. They have people who don't know where they're going to sleep at night. And too often the church just stands by and thinks someone else will do it. 
And when we read Acts and we know the history of the church movement, there's nothing that we can do outside of respond and say, that's our job. We're not going to wait. We're not going to look at other people. We're going to encourage other churches to do it, but we're not going to wait on them either because that's the church. And for us at Collective, that's where we have our roots. The roots are found in that book of Acts. The roots are found in taking care of people. They're found in praising God. They're found in praying. They're found in community. And they're found in truly what the church is called to be. And I hope we can be that church. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that, um, to be honest, that we don't have to figure this out on our own. God, that as we decided to start collective and a group of people got together and said, okay, let's do this. God, that we didn't have to make it up. God, that we didn't have to, to pick and choose along the way. That God, ultimately, we have the blueprint right in front of us in Acts 2. God, that ultimately that whole book is about how this church began and how this group of people went out and made a difference and impacted people and moved people closer to you. And so, God, I just pray as a church that we can be a church like that. God, that we let those things that are non-essential, we let those things that divide churches, we let those things that really don't matter, God, that we let those things go. And God, ultimately, that we, we have unity on the things that matter, that there's liberty on the things that don't. And ultimately, God, that across the board, whether it's people in this church or other churches or other Christians all over the place can support each other and say, we're in this together. God, I pray for this church right now uh, that we are that church. God, that as we look at Acts, that that is the DNA of who we are, that if people ask, uh, or people in our community said, okay, what is Collective all about? We'd be able to say, it's caring for our community. It's following God. It's being in a community. It's praising. It's worship. It's prayer. God, I pray that we, we can become that church and we'll continue to be that church. God, help us meet the needs. Help us figure out how to do that. God, we know that we don't have to do it alone. But God, ultimately, help us be a church that really does care for the people around us, not just in, in word or a theory, but in our action. God, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.